Hello everyone, happy Women's Day 2024. Today we will listen to uh, three interesting stories from women uh, around the world and uh, it will be all about how Earth Observations has been used to accelerate progress and it's the women who does it. Now my name is Bentili Yabi, I'm going to be your host uh, but uh, before we really start the program, I will encourage you to use the chat to ask questions. After all the presentations, the three presentations, you will be uh, given the possibility to raise your hand and get into the room. Uh, I'll have to put to give one by one the, um, the entrance to the stage, so to speak. And uh, then we will have a discussion after all the uh, presentations. We will have hopefully a discussion among the uh, presenters uh, and also with you. Uh, please uh, sit back and enjoy the stories. Uh, we will uh, learn first from um, Nancy a little bit about who is organizing this, namely the GEOEDI subgroup. What is that, Nancy? Yeah, thanks, Bente. My name is Nancy Searby. I work at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. in the United States. And I am part of the Equality, Diversity, and Inclusion subgroup, or EDI subgroup, of the Group on Earth Observations. And our group is all about trying to in, improve and increase and share our passion for equality, diversity, and inclusion. And we are working actively across the GEO program so that those aspects of our work together are considered, addressed, and embedded in everything we do. So I'm really looking forward to hearing the stories today. Thanks for uh, inviting us to uh, share these stories. Back to you, Dante. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. So that was a little bit about the frame of this webinar. And now we can dive into these very interesting stories. And the first one is um, uh, Carlotta Santolini from Italy, who is going to talk about how we can eat aliens, basically. So Carlotta, uh, the floor is yours. Tell us a little bit about yourself and, and then tell us your story. My name is Carlotta Santolini. I'm a marine biologist and a PhD student in climate change and sustainable development. I'm a marine biologist and even a diving instructor. And today, uh, first of all, I'm so happy to be here and even to be, uh, I'm, it's an honor for me to attend this event. And I would like to talk about uh, a project that I created with, with my friends and colleagues, because we are five women that try to um, create a project to make people understand, first of all, that it's important to uh, shift the attention from the traditional commercial species to the alien species, and so to change the mentality, the mentality of Italian people to decide what to eat but even because uh, we are an example of how women can create something uh, and to believe in our dreams. So uh, we are five women and we created this project that is called Mariscadoras, where Mariscadoras are those uh, young women, th those women that works, uh, uh, that fights for their rights, in particular in Spain, like in Galicia. And uh, they create like a movement to uh, for the gender equality in the maritime sector that is a male-owned uh, sector. And so we decided to honor them with this name because we work with the fishermen in Italy and we saw that it's very hard, but even that is possible. And this is my team. So Julia is the business manager because she graduated in economies. Uh, Ilaria is the um, social media manager and even uh, the cooker because uh, she graduated in uh, culinary art. Uh, Matilda is the management because she is a management engineer. I'm the marine biologist and Alicia is the anthropologist. So she takes care about the rights for women and all the histories of women that we met in our, um, in our work. Uh, today, 
I would like to talk about the blue crab. I don't know if you know what alien species are, but the alien species are those species that are moved from an area into another one that where they weren't present before, like the blue crabs that arrived in the Mediterranean Sea because of ballast water. And because of these crabs, we had some problems in Italy because it spread out the last summer. And so because of that, a lot of fishermen lost lost their works and their jobs and so um, we had to do something to to save the um, economies of, uh, of fishermen in Italy and uh, indeed the, the blue crabs uh, uh, can create uh, problems to rem to the marine ecosystem for the the, the because uh, uh, it did it doesn't have uh, uh, predators, and so it feeds whatever it eats. And so this is this represents a problem for the economy of fishing uh, in Italy because they feed the, the commercial species. A damage to um, to the uh, small scale fishing because of course uh, they can ruin all the fishing gears, but even the danger for bathing and so the problems of tourism. And so um, we create Bluit, uh, La Pescheria Sostenibile, that is a project uh, um, dedicated to open up some new uh, scenarios uh, for the management of alien species because in this way we can we wanted to create like a food chain of the um, blue crabs and so we create a line of uh, transformation of the blue crabs in order to create like a market demand um, so our aims are the cooking, so we want to implement the consumption of alien species in particular as a food, but even to shift the attention, as I said, um, from the demand of fish market from the traditional commercial fishes uh, to the uh, alien species. Um, we want to create a, a sustainable fishing because uh, we work with fishermen that use only target um, target uh, cages because in these target traps because in this way they can only fish the blue crabs and not the other biodiversity and uh, the circular economy because uh, we are uh, creating a project in the laboratory where the waste of blue crabs is used to create bioplastic. So in this way, we can create a circular economy in order to use even the waste. Uh, so we want to announce the value of blue crabs in Italy and to do it we create a line of uh, a food processing line of alien product and to do it we uh, ask the fishermen to create a networking in order to be able to have some tons per day uh, of blue crabs so that we can transform the, the blue crabs into pulp, so meat, or even into products that we can sell to the Oreca sector, so the restaurants, the GDO sector, so the supermarkets, and the foreign markets like US. Um, we start in, in December 2021 after a travel that I did in the Mediterranean Sea by sailing boat. And uh, after that, we started to do some steps. First of all, <laughs> to uh, present ourselves as five uh, um, girls, five women that had an idea and we wanted to transform it into our work. But after that, we uh, started to sell the blue crabs uh, into the US market. And so we uh, we were able to start it in uh, August 2023 because the past year we used to we used the past year to like to do pr the production and now in November we started this new project that is the circular economy in order to close the the, the circle of the blue crab. So our values are, first of all, the gender equality, because we are five women, as I said, and even because uh, we work in a male sector, but even the circular economy. And uh, of course, we uh, want to be part of the agenda 20, 2030. Uh, so our next steps uh, are about the research for the circular economy, because we are we did the production in the laboratory, so we started to work for the research, but now we want to do the upscale in order to be able to create like some products for the industry 
and we are able to do like a technical support with the um, with the researcher centers in order to better understand how we can finalize uh, the product. So these are some pictures of us. This is what we did in the laboratory. So this is a plastic uh, starting from the <laughs> crab waste and we presented it into um, an international uh, conference. And these are some of the awards that we won uh, in uh, Bella Vita, it was in Chicago, and the other uh, was one in East Island, and uh, the, the others in Italy. And this is our first cargo that left uh, for uh, US uh, in August uh, um, 2023. So thank you for the attention and I'm here if you want to ask me something. Thank you very much, uh, Carlotta. We are moving uh, uh, on in the program uh, for yet another interesting story. It's uh, called Weaving Transdisciplinary Collaborations on Climate and Health. And we are excited to hear about the mystery behind this title. Uh, it will be Anna uh, Anna Stewart Ibarra that will give us this information. She is a uh, director at the Inter-American Institute in Uruguay. So Anna, may I give the floor to you. Uh, let us hear a little bit about yourself and then the story you have to tell us. Happy International Women's Day. And it really is a joy to be here with everyone and to share this space with such an inspirational group. Uh, of people. So I'm going to share a bit about my journey as a scientist and as an international civil servant and about my what I've learned about fostering equitable research partnerships. And in honor of today's event, I'm also going to spotlight other women who I work with. So I want to open with this metaphor of weaving, a weaving of partnerships and a view of life on earth as interwoven and interconnected with other people. Sandra Diaz, who you see here, a leading biodiversity scientist from Argentina, states, by thinking about the living world as an intermeshed fabric, we start to shift or broaden the spotlight of inquiry and action, making them more focused on connections and entanglement and more interdisciplinary and socially inclusive. This is a small but necessary step to rally a wider range of society into producing new knowledge and spurring action for a better future. So in 2007, I began working in Ecuador with local communities, the Ministry of Health and Institute of Meteorology and Hydrology to investigate dengue fever. And at that time, dengue was becoming a major public health threat. And through this research, we began to understand how climate was affecting disease outbreaks. For example, during El Nino years, like this year, we saw a greater likelihood of dengue outbreaks. Earth observations were essential to this work because they provided critical climate information to fill in the historical time series when we lacked information from local stations. And through this process, we worked with local partners to co-develop a prototype for a dengue forecast system to predict disease outbreaks by combining information from Earth observations and local data. So importantly, through the process, I also learned about partnerships with local communities and government agencies, I learned about centering trust and legitimacy with communities in the local media, about listening with humility and adapting my ideas, and about using my position of privilege to support my partners. Here you can see an overview of the approach that informed our work, linking local disease and climate data and epidemiological data with earth observations to develop models that could better predict epidemics. These kinds of early warning models are important tools for the health sector to respond to the growing threats of climate change. And today they're one of the key strategies being used to adapt to climate change. In 2017, I began working with a team on a project led by the Ministry of Health and Wellness of Barbados and the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology to develop a dengue early warning system. This built on the last decade of work in Ecuador but it had the advantage of being situated in a country that had prioritized work on climate and health. And as a small island developing state with an economy dependent on tourism, Barbados had realized the urgent need to address the growing risk of dengue fever outbreaks. Our team has focused on a collaborative modeling approach to develop a dengue early warning tool. And through ongoing dialogues, we have met with, to discuss the needs of the health and the climate sectors 
the current capacities of the sectors, and possible solutions. We have focused on building trusting partnerships and centering local priorities, thus increasing the potential for this early warning tool to inform day-to-day -day decision making in the health sector. In 2019, I made the jump from academia to join the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research, the IAI. We're an intergovernmental body serving 19 countries of the Americas. And in 2023, I assumed the role of executive director as the first woman director in the organization's history. The II was established over 30 years ago by a treaty signed by its member countries. We were established to address the growing threat of global environmental changes that transcend the boundaries of any one nation and require regional scientific cooperation to generate the data and information that governments can use to, better, to make better decisions. Today, the most pressing issues that have been identified by our member states are climate change, loss of biodiversity and ecosystem services, water scarcity, health issues, inequality, and poverty. We focus on transdisciplinary approaches that bring together scientists from social and biophysical sciences with non-academics, experts from local communities or governments to co-produce knowledge. Equitable collaborations and participatory processes are really at the heart of transdisciplinary science. At the IEI, I've had the opportunity to develop research funding calls to support and train research networks across the Americas and to fund research teams. For example, three years ago, we began a process to train and fund research networks working on climate, environment, and health issues. And we launched a series of massive open virtual courses, and then we developed a tailored training program. We are now funding 12 research teams with 134 investigators from 15 countries. 10 of our 12 lead investigators are women, and one third are early career scientists. I firmly believe through this process that we are planting the seeds for the next decade of climate and health action in the region. One example of one of these projects is led by Dr. Santos, who you can see here. This project is focused on waterborne diseases in Chile. She and her team are combining information from satellite imagery with field measurements to develop water quality monitoring system. Another example is the MAPFIRE project led by Dr. Liana Anderson. This project was part of an earlier research funding cycle at the IAI. The team worked across Brazil, Bolivia, and Peru in the tri-border region of the Amazon to address the threat of wildfires. They used satellite imagery to develop a near real-time monitoring and warning system for local governments and other stakeholders. They also developed an educational curriculum on disaster risk reduction available in Spanish and Portuguese which is being used in local schools. Lastly, these experiences have reinforced my passion for equitable research collaborations. Over the last four years, I worked with my dear friend, Dr. Desiree Labode, to edit a book on equitable global health partnerships with contributions from over 90 authors from 26 countries, sharing their experiences and visions for the future. This book will be published later this year by Springer and it will be completely open access. Here you can see some of the key tenets from the book that I wanted to share with you. And these were from, again, more than 90 people around the world who have decades of experience. And just wanted to emphasize the importance that our work recognizes the current inequities, hence the, the event that we're in today, and that we work actively to disrupt and change the status quo. But at the same time that we can find our joy and the power of our connections and our interconnectedness, that we center trust in our relationships while staying open and humble to learning. And that we also recognize that we are working within per imperfect systems, but we find the energy to keep going and that we can bring our whole selves in our service and persist in hopefulness. So in closing, I wanted to share with you the image of the condor and the eagle. So there's a prophecy that describes the condor and the eagle flying together for a better new world. The condor represents the wisdom of the south and the eagle, the wisdom of the north. We need to work together to bring all of our gifts to be able to evolve and grow together. And I believe this is why we are here today. Thank you again, and I'm happy to take any questions. Wow, Anna, that was very inspiring. And so many recognizable um, 
things you mentioned on collaboration across cultures, groups, uh, disciplines. I, I, it's, uh, I, I really feel that's very one of the reasons I'm where I am also, because it's so inspiring to work with people from across. And being uh, humble uh, and listen and learn is also one of the things that I appreciate with this uh, collaboration. So thank you for sharing that with us. And um, please do ask questions in the chat for Anna. Anna has to go uh, on uh, on the hour, but I think we will have time to discuss and ask you questions after we hear the last story of, uh, of today. Uh, so thank you, Anna. And now we are moving on to you, Nikki. Uh, we are going to hear about also weaving. I really like this this word. Uh, it was funny that you both have that, uh, you know, weaving in your titles. So weaving knowledge, earth observations in indigenous communities. So Nikki Tully, you are working with NASA, but also another organization. And I leave it to you to, uh, to, to tell us more about that and about yourself. So the floor is yours. Nikki, sorry, Nikki. My name is Nikki Tooley, and today I'll be sharing a story in, in a bit of a different manner, and I, I hope you stay along with me in these next few minutes about how I'm structuring this a bit differently. Uh, but th what I'm sharing with you today is this weaving of knowledge of Earth observations and in indigenous communities. So I work with Barry NASA Ames Research Center with the Indigenous Peoples Initiative, as well as with the Environmental uh, Justice uh, Program as well within NASA. But why I wanted to share with you a little bit why I started off with this um, this weaving the topic here. Um, so I'm from the Navajo Nation, which is a indigenous group here in the United States, a tribal nation located in the southwest of the United States. And why I wanted to share this concept of weaving is on this day of International Women's Day, I'm really grateful for this opportunity to share with you a bit about my, my journey, um, like was done in the previous presentation, but share with you of the journey that started long before I was born. So I'm part of a matrilineal society. That's what the Navajo uh, people identify as, or, or we call ourselves. And, the, and a big part of our our culture is textiles and weavings. We're a, a weaving nation. And so I, when I heard a couple of times growing up, and, and so I hope you can see some of the items I have sharing with you here of some of our textiles and some of the tools that we have as weavers. And when we sit down at the, I've been told when we sit down at the, the loom that we have, we're sitting down at the universe. And in each of those loom parts and the tools we have are, are different aspects of things that are representative of, of the universe. And, and I share this with you in this title that it, yes, it's weaving of knowledge systems, but also it's different forms of earth observations and, and recognizing the opportunities for different use of, of concepts of earth observations within different realms of what we can consider data. A couple of years ago, I traveled to California to uh, to see the launch of Landsat 9. And a couple weeks after Landsat 9 was launched, a first light image came and it showed a portion of the Navajo Nation. And I, I share this image with you here as as this uh, satellite image that was collected and taken of, of the, the place I call home. And it reminded me at that time, and even so to this day, of this journey that I've been on in the area of earth observation and, and remote sensing and, and satellite imagery and the stories that it tells, but recognizing, like I shared with you um, in, in the title and in the items that I showed you, that this, this aspect and this longstanding earth observation has been told and, and, and shared long before I was born and long before this introduction and, and weaving of knowledges of earth observation from indigenous knowledge and Western science came together. And I want to start my story there with you all. I'm from an area called Blue Gap, Arizona and on the Navajo Nation. And this here is a, a a uh, satellite image showing you of that homeland that I come from. And as you can see, it's a, a semi-arid region. So you can definitely see some of where the waterways come together, where some of the high and low points are. And what was really nice in, in understanding of attending that Landsat 9 launch and, and recognizing my journey of, of growing up on the Navajo Nation and the aspects of earth observations that I was taught even before entering Western science is what I wanna share with you today. 
So as an Indigenous woman from the Navajo Nation and, and as a Navajo person in general, when we introduce ourselves and we share who we are, it would go something like this. And so what I'm sharing with you is, is this identity of, of who I am as an Indigenous person, but as an Indigenous woman more specifically. And the, well, the words that I've shared with you in my language and like I mentioned earlier, is that we're a matrilineal society. And the, the aspects of these four main clanships are these four main points of identity that shows who I am comes from the, the mother line, comes from the line of the mother. The first being my mother, who I who is here on the far right screen and um, comes from the grandmothers. And it comes from um, from the four different parts of your family. And so I, I share this with you to bring that understanding of of the identity that comes through the, the, the female uh, lineage that, that I have as an individual, as a Navajo person. But recognizing even in this identity and in this introduction that I'm sharing with you is a form of earth observation. There you can see a, 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 in it, an image of, of a collective of drawings that show different aspects and elements of, of earth observation. And I, I share this with you to acknowledge this importance that I, I share within the work that I do, not only as a scientist, but as an indigenous scientist who, who is a woman, and that is indigenous knowledge as science. I share this landscape with you and, and shared with you in my introduction, but also in, in this textile that I showed you in, in the beginning of this presentation, that there's different elements of earth observations that has always been shared. And where my work comes in is this opportunity to blend the two knowledge systems together for myself personally, but also now being able to share that a bit more in the work that I do um, with the team that I'm part of with the Indigenous Peoples Initiative within, uh, within NASA. And why I share you this image here is to show you the, the, the teachings of the landscapes, but also recognizing of the history and the uh, and the history and the changes of the landscape and people and community that ha that has always existed. And so here in this picture, I'm, I'm holding up a, a, a rock, a form of sandstone from where I, I come from in Blue Gap, Arizona. And you'll be able to see if you look a little closer that the fossils and the indentations of where seashells once existed. And so recognizing that this area once was ocean, and so I bring this again back to this knowledge of, of what I have received from my family. And again, going on this theme of the, the importance of the teachings that I have gotten from the woman in my family, I return yet again to my grandmother who taught me that everything has a purpose and relationship to the overall system. And what she shared with me oftentimes was that something down to the smallest insect, to the changes of that we're experiencing now of what we, we call climate change, changes in climates, and also with the, the, the importance of, of sunlight, especially in the area of the earth observations I am with, with remote sensing. Looking at all of these three aspects and, and her teachings share different points. And, it, and that is that through this collective and diversity of thought, more understanding can come about. And so I shared with you this, this aspects of landscapes, starting with those uh, earth images that in, in the first two slides of this presentation. And I show you this slide again. And this was the one of the first satellite images that I, I able was able to look at and kind of analyze. And as I went to university and, and left my home um, and anything that sounded like the language that was spoken around me or even with people who look like me, who talk like me, and I went to university, it was a bit of a culture shock. But in that culture shock, I found a comfort with earth observations and the aspects of satellite imagery to where I could use these images to re return home and, and see the landscapes I grew up in. But then in, in these red rectangles here, looking at the landscapes beyond just um, wanting to see home, I also began to see how you could analyze things that are going on in home. And in this way, I started to have this opportunity to see how to connect these two knowledge systems of, of what I shared with you, of what I got from my family and my community, and then learned in, in the Western science, it was called scientific methodology. But for us, it was called and then essentially looking at how to maintain this harmony. And for us in, in Western science, that might also be looked at as sustainability in different forms, conservation, 
observation and in, in the scientific methodology of, of you all might know and within the STEM realm, there's this way of creating a hypothesis to getting an endpoint. And in our language as well, in our understanding that exists from the Sahakesh to Sit Hassan, thinking through the, the realm of assessing. And in this way, I was able to bring again that knowledge I received from home and, and from the, the teachings of my families, from my grandmothers, my mothers, and my, par my parents, both of them, my father and my mother, and seeing how both of these interchange together. And so you'll see a, a number of different topics under these, these thumbnails here of these images. And if you think about it in a Western science, Format, I realized that what I was learning at home wasn't so foreign after all in, in the university and other academic setting I, I, I went to. And that is that I, I learned furthermore about geometry, about rangeland management, about geomorphology, geology, hydrology, physics, and, and realizing how all of these not only are, are representations of what we find within the realm of earth observations I'm in, but also in the teachings that were, were shared on both sides. And I wanna share this quote here with you and, and, and recognizing it and that it says, unfortunately, there's a great deal of critical knowledge that has remained outside of the carefully ordered uh, ca characterization of Western thought and is making these holistic concepts difficult to comprehend for those who have been trained to see the world in fractured pieces. It is this fractured view that has been created from the fracturing of our societies and an environment. And this came from another individual from another tribal nation in the United States. And in, in sharing that thought that she has shared, I was able to now co connect that even more to the work that I do with the NASA's Indigenous Peoples Initiative, which stands on three pillars. And, and so you can see my team members' names there um, included who work with the IPI. But I want to address this point to you of, I shared with you this indigenous aspect of, of who I am, where I come from, how this knowledge started to come about and, and how that started to interlink within Western science and then ultimately now of what I do with, with NASA's Indigenous Peoples Initiative. And that is con that continued basis of recognizing community, the place-based approaches, the technical aspects that can come together and recognizing the indigenous knowledge systems. And in these approaches, we're able to develop this opportunity to work with indigenous nations within the United, United States and, and a couple of opportunities outside of the United States of, of building this relationships through workshops, these cross-boundary connections, these, these deep engagements, these hands-on trainings. And this really goes into that connecting with the, the tribal nations, either through employees, community members, or other members. And this is just an example of how, this is one tool that is an example of how that has all kind of come together through, through one application, and that's called the Drought Severity Evaluation Tool. And so what this did, again, it kind of thinking of this theme of the, what I've shared with you of this indigenous knowledge connecting to Western science and, and coming collectively as, as many different aspects of group members, this is, is one way that this has been done where we took uh, ground data from the Navajo Nation that was shared, satellite data, looked at model data and drought indices to create a, 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 a platform to where this information could be shared, to where an understanding of drought in a different way in a form of obser earth observation could be made. And it didn't stop there. Most recently, last year, there was an opportunity to expand this knowledge within the Navajo Nation to, to share more understanding about what earth observation is within the Western science lens, but also what earth observation is in connection to the community in which the in this particular case, speaking specifically to the Navajo Nation, what was shared. And ultimately what this is all doing is bringing these two things together for, for future generations. And I share with you that long vibrant history of, of the impact of, of women in my life and in my family and my tribe and my community, but also now realizing this opportunity I have as an indigenous science to um, be that continued conduit of sharing of information, of, of sharing of knowledge for the future generations. And, and that's what I, I aim to do now, sharing that opportunity to include earth observation users to empower their local communities with education and, and other forms of earth observation and connecting the two together. So I thank you for this time to be able to participate in this opportunity to share Thank you, Nikki. That was a, a, a totally fascinating. And again, um, 
as we also observed actually earlier this morning where we were having stories from Asia and uh, New Zealand, um, uh, we, it, it's this, this, uh, this communication across generations. And you highlighted this specifically through the mothers and grandmothers. Uh, and that was, you know, special for it, for you in this in this in this set of stories. But it was the same. It, it, we came to the same sort of uh, observation that you know this this communication across generations is is very important. Now we are done with the presentations, but uh, so the, I I encourage you to to ask for the floor. You in the uh, in the audience, uh, you have to raise your hand. There's a button where you can, you know, click and raise your hand, and I will uh, observe it. Uh, and meanwhile, while you are thinking about raising your hand or writing a comment or questions in the chat, uh, I think we can have a, a chat among ourselves in uh, on the scene uh, on the on the on the stage here. So I don't know, uh, Nancy, do you have any burning questions to ask for uh, to the presenters? We have a whiteboard. You clicked. Maybe you missed a button and wanted to click on the microphone. <laughs> That's it. Thank you for knowing what I did wrong. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I just want to say thank you for um, these amazing presentations. Um, I just was wondering, Nikki and Anna, as you've listened to each other's presentations and you both talked about weaving, um, do you see that connectivity in the stories that you share? Could you just like maybe re react to the, the connection in your presentations? Do you want to go first, Nikki? Do you want me to jump in? Um, yeah, you, you can go ahead and go first. I, I, I have some points too that I really enjoyed about your presentation. I'd be curious to see what you, you might kind of um, might have or some see some of those connecting pieces. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there was a lot of just the, a lot of resonance, I think, is, is the word. Different approaches, we're coming from different places, different life experiences, and yet a lot of resonance around the need to, the, the metaphor of weaving also resonates with me. Uh, my grandma was a weaver in the Ecuadorian Andes. So the, these ideas of, it's not about, you know, one way being better or worse or sort of superimposition, but really the, how do we bring together to create a better, more rich textile or fabric uh, in the work that we do through our partnerships, through our relationships. I think this relational focus is what's, to me, become really central in my work. And that's relational, again, with the people, but also with all aspects of life. Yeah, yeah, I, I really agree with that point as well, Anna, is that, that we're not trying to say that one knowledge system supersedes the other. And when we, we look at it, it's really that re relational type of understanding that brings this vibrancy of what diversity and equity and inclusion does is that if we look at it in the form of weaving, it's that we're taking different elements from maybe from different parts of the landscapes. If, if we're looking, thinking directly of how you create a textile, if, if uh, you got the animal, you got the the vegetation, you got the human, you got the you got the wood, you got the, the different aspects of of the ecosystem or different ways of, of living that are coming together to create this textile, and and one without the other couldn't exist. And it, it's really understanding, I guess, like the necessity of, of that inclusion of all to see the importance. And I think taking that knowledge from what I got at, from my early um, life, um, from my, especially from my grandmother that I showed in the presentation, is that it was it's, it was recognizing that to say you're you're never really better than anybody. Don't think in that kind of way. You're you're bringing something to the table, and that's like what we could maybe identify as your data or your knowledge or your background, whether that's in academia, your career, your profession, but down to, I guess, like to the heart and soul of who you are and the good that you want to bring to the world, I think is what really came about. And I see that in the work now and this opportunity to, to be able to do that together and, and, and building that um, network together. And so seeing the work that Anna, that you are doing with the community and, and recognizing that 
it's not just one particular part of community you're interested in working with or having an impact on. It's this holistic understanding of what community is. And I think that's really um, a, a nice kind of understanding I have of that holistic nature and the kind of the connections to weaving that has in that kind of mentality. Very interesting. Um, another thing that struck me with both your presentations, uh, Nikki and Anna, was was the the component of love. I, I really felt like you were loving, loving the, uh, uh, particularly you, Nikki, that there's a love of nature, you know, respect and love of nature. And I recognize this for myself as, you know, uh, independent of uh, there's no such lineage as you are talking about in, in my family like this. But growing up in the countryside and just looking at the stars and being in the forest and where, you know, you feel sort of a connectivity with nature. And that is also when I, you know, I, I run my own company now for research and consultancy. And I say explore with love. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big motivator. And I'm wondering, so I, at my age, I feel it's okay to bring these emotions and feelings into science. Uh, but when I was younger, that was not, uh, you know, appropriate. Is it, is it something, the female perspective, or am I wrong in my assumption here? I, this, this is what was very clear here to me now that we, we sort of uh, communicate some sort of love <laughs> of nature. I don't know, Nancy, you, yeah. I was just gonna respond. Like, I think for, for my part on maybe like that kind of messaging of love shared for the environment kind of comes with that cultural upbringing that I had. And, and that is that you are of the earth essentially. And so mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, for example, the term we have for mother earth is uh, and when we say my mother, if I was gonna refer to my mother, I'd say Shema. And so that same kind of phrase of like that living being to connected, it kind of is like one and the same of that that family type of relationship, not necessarily just family with another like human being, but family of like you're you're part of this life cycle that you couldn't exist like one without the other. For example, a human couldn't survive without water, but the water also mm -hmm. needs to be filtrated through the geology makeup. And so it's like, really, if you think about it deeply in that kind of connected way, it's that love comes in also, and I think um, in the form of understanding of respect as well. And I think that's kind of how it transpires. And so being taught that early on, and especially with the clans that I shared, elements mm -hmm. of the earth are, are brought up into your identity. And so there's not way, one way to separate it. It's just who you are and, and how you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe I'll echo on that. I, um, I was reading a quote from the Dalai Lama this morning as part of my morning routine. And um, and it basically he was saying that um, women's compassion uh, is something that seems to be kind of inherent with women to have that compassionate nature and how important that was as um, we really understand how interconnected the world is these days and that women in leadership um, bring that compassion. And so I guess the question to you um, both would be, Nikki, you're earlier in your career. Anna, you're a little later in your career. So how do you reflect on, on um, like what advice would you give to other women about like the value of earth observations, the value of understanding this interconnectedness and this weaving, how might you suggest that they be bold? But I would say I was raised as an engineer, right? 10% women, and you definitely did not show your emotions, right? No, no. Yeah. So like, just like, like how, do you, bad. <laughs> how do you holistically show up authentically as a woman today? What would you advise others? That's a very good question. I'll take a step back and just share a little bit of the experience in working on this book that I mentioned. So it's all around relationship and partnership and equitable transformations in the field of global health, which has a very deep colonial history, the origins of the field of global health. And so there's been a lot of 
um, reflection and active work in the field of global health in the last few years to transform a lot of the colonial models. And so this book kind of was born in that context. But what was interesting is that most of the book authors in the end are women, although they were, it was not just women who were invited, but it seemed like more women were interested in kind of stepping up and writing and talking about their experiences. And the last few, the last few chapters of the book are about envisioning a new future. And a lot of that is about how do we ensure that we bring our whole selves to the work that we do, because we have been taught to leave, to amputate ourselves, to not bring that part. That part is not allowed. That's not good. That's not legitimate. It's not robust scientifically enough. And yet, you know, when we are able to bring our whole selves, we are able to serve better. We are able to lead better. We are able to, I think, be more satisfied and authentic and just kind of have more impact to, to do the good in the world that we need to do. And I think that um, there's a big role for mentors to play here in terms of people who are later in the career, women and men, to help open the doors and create spaces and to support people who, as they come along, sort of the, the mentorship piece is incredibly important. Um, and being able to, but also to, to have that sort of self, that process of internal reflection to recognize first that we're in this imperfect system. Like how have we been conditioned also to leave part of ourselves outside the door? And then how do we sort of heal and recover and come back by finding people, I think who, um, share that vision. Again, be it men or women, but to find allies and solidarity. It's amazing. The further I go on my career path, I find so many amazing people, men and women, who are thinking, you know, in these sort of much more inclusive and I would say broad ways of thinking that expand beyond just what you're taught, you know, in your science classrooms and that we are whole people and that we bring our our families, our communities, our spirituality with our science and our technical minds. So how do, you know, we're connecting our mind and our heart to, to really come back to address the planetary crisis that we're in. Because I think we're in this mess because we decided to cut off the, the heart and just look at the, the mind, largely from a masculine sort of approach. That was a long way. That was a not very direct answer, Nancy, but. <laughs> that was great. No, I, I think it's really, uh, really great. Yeah, it's, it's great to share this, the, the, the views. Yeah, I, I would kind of say that I, I feel definitely very fortunate to grow up in a matrilineal society first before entering into any other form of idea of how you see the, the world. But the, like for me and in, in my upbringing, it was like the woman held a, a very important piece to the household, to the family. And so I didn't recognize that that would be different until I, I left my family and my home and community and, and went into this other one where most of the professors were all male, all the department heads department heads and university were all male all your like your um the student body was primarily male nancy you mentioned the engineering kind of background so like when you're in these engineering classes when you're in these hydrology classes that that most often that was you were like one of two women in the classroom and so it, it, i that was kind of a bit shocking to me but I, again i think it was that early on onset of teaching that that really helped me and in, in Kind of maintaining who ourself and, and I guess in a way being stubborn so it's like you were, you were growing up as a young person to say the woman it holds this position of being like a precious stone essentially and so as that early I guess we kind of learn about that with childhood development like those first few years are very key to who you are as a person or something I don't know how the literature goes but essentially that's very important I think so I think that's where that stubbornness came from I was like you can't change my mindset of what somebody already told me who I am and who I'm going to be meant to be. And so when I, that picture in my slide that I shared with the rock um, and that view of the landscape, that was actually a part of the, the womanhood ceremony that I had of going from a child to a woman. And so it was that point of like recognition of different points in your life that you had. It was just impossible to let go of, of not holding yourself to, um, a higher plane, not necessarily like be in, in being something superior, but recognizing like who you are. And so I think for other women, other women and other young girls and females that are entering into different realms, I would say that that would, what teaching that I got that I'd probably share with them is to stay strong to your identity 
and that the right people and right opportunities are going to come to you. Not everything is meant for to be in your life or to meant it to be in your path, but that right opportunity will come. And I think um, Anna really shared this nicely when she said, like, be your whole self, like look for mentors, look for those opportunities to build allies. And I think in that way, that's how most often now thinking about my life now at this point is um, that's how I'm, I'm able to keep that unique, unique nature about myself and, and what I bring. But again, that's just like being brave enough to be your true self. And you'll find those mentors and allies and opportunities to support that along the way. And what will is meant to be will be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, uh, Nikki, you are saying, I, I'm thinking that uh, there's a big responsibility for parents today, particularly with respect to girls, to let them know and know, never doubt that they are able to do whatever they want to do. I mean, in, in terms of choosing and have this self-respect and self-confidence um, uh, uh, that, that you cannot... I mean, it's very important to have it from your a little girl. Huh? It's it's uh, and it sounds like this is something very strong. It's very inspiring to hear. Uh, this is put into sort of a cultural system. It sounds like you have rituals and everything around it, um, and the power of that is, yeah, uh, very interesting and uh, should be a reminder for for us. The rest of us to never never miss an opportunity to say something nice and uh, confirmative to 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 young girls in this you know since we are on the women's day to say this to the young girls you can do it you know this was great you know simple things like that to build the confidence because <laughs> we know there will be there will be some battles in our lives huh? <laughs> we cannot avoid them so <laughs> we need to have this confidence yeah, I, th I think like that's a big important piece that kind of played into it. Um, so my dad never had any sons. He has all female daughters. So it's all girls is, is the household, my mother and a bunch of daughters. And so I think one thing that he did teach us was that never think that there's nothing that a man can do that you can't do. And I think that was not only a cultural teaching, but a perspective that he had. And so for myself personally, it was him saying, I'm going to teach you how to work on cars. I'm going to teach you how to lay a foundation to a house. I'm going to teach you how to speak up in a room where there's, there's no women, there's only men. And I think it was that kind of opportunity that I see that was very beneficial. And, and now with my, my nieces, um, be, again, like being on this International Women's Day with my nieces, that's what I'm saying now to yeah. them, like giving them that opportunity to that little push to be like, you're unstoppable, you're unbelievable, you're you're smart, you're amazing, you're you're one of a kind. And I think, like you're saying, like those words of ki a kind um, kindness, but also affirmations of of what we could give to um, to young girls, to other women, to to grandmothers, like. And, and anybody else in society, but again, looking at this, what this particular day is, I think we hold a lot of power in our words. And if there's just a little bit more of love and kindness that we might add, I think it could definitely transpire into something larger. Yeah, but I think there's also a role for as we move in our career trajectories to make space for those who come with us, with us, after us. You know, I think of, for example, when I joined the organization I'm with now, um, four and a half years ago, when I joined at the time, I asked about the maternity leave policy and they didn't know because the last time someone had had a baby in the organization was about 20 years ago. There were, there were no small children. It was this idea that this is an international organization. You're a civil servant, like your work comes first. Family is, a set, is an afterthought. And yet that has totally changed. Today, most of my staff members have family, have small kids. A lot of that was actually a gift of the pandemic in that we are all working remotely. And so I think how great is it that we can actually make changes in an organization, change the organization culture and open space for young people who want to have families and still be engaged in an international science space. Whereas a few years ago, maybe they would have thought that that would have been impossible for them. Um, so. I have uh, a three and a half year old son and I have a stepdaughter who's 17. And to me, it's also a, a husband who provides 150 support, <laughs> so, you know, 150 percent support so I can do my work. And I, you know, I have a lot of international travel as well. Uh, 
but being able to, you know, work with and mentor and support now the colleagues, the postdocs and the fellows who are coming into my organization who have young families has also been really, um, really meaningful for me. And I hope that, you know, other people did that for me before and how we can continue to transform the organizations that we're in so that each person can, again, bring their whole selves. Yeah. I, that's a, a nice word. I, I look at the time we are on the top of our hour and uh, based on the development of this, you know, this discussion here, it sounds like uh, uh, we can go through being mo role models and tell our stories. We can inspire more women, girls and women to enjoy the very rewarding uh, work we do with Earth observations in different forms. And so with that, I think I will conclude unless you have a, a last word, uh, Nancy, that you want to share. Only thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was such a nice start on the weekend here with these stories. Thank you very much. Thank you. Happy International Women's Day. <laughs>